Hi, this is Steve Reifman. We've just finished a week by week journey through my travel from 50 years ago. But now we'd like to present something special in regard to my two journeys across and up into Afghanistan. So welcome to a wonderful reprise of those times of sweet memories in Afghanistan. Twenty-eight April, 1971, Wednesday, Herat, Afghanistan. I got off that bus and I crawled into a beautiful little tea house. Then somehow we make it to a hotel and walk around this fantastic desert town. It's absolutely a bizarre place, which makes Morocco look civilized. Hashish is simply everywhere, while in a tea house made of mud, making music with a German kid, me and the English blokes, Roger and Dick are offered a large patty of hashish, like a full-size hamburger. The city is so fantastic, with desert ruins all around. But it's the life and the people that are different. These people are great, quite lively, as they interact vitally with us. And I wind up buying a knife. Oh my God, my fourth night knife of the trip. And it's an Afghani knife, a very interesting knife. The Afghani tea house you see behind me is typical. Much of it though is inside because the weather can be inclement in the winter. It's not exactly a warm, balmy place all year round. I was there in April and it was actually still quite cold. It gets quite hot in the summer. But these tea houses are where the action is. Each one of them in the back has a hashish room with giant hookahs. And these would be huge pots, kind of a base, if you will, and having two sticks stick out, one with the hashish and one to suck on with a lot of water. Oftentimes, you have to actually stand on a wooden platform because they're so big, and the Afghanis are relatively short compared to me, except for, of course, some of them who are quite tall. It's a varied people. But what isn't varied is these tea houses. This is the way it was in Afghanistan in those days, and it was a big part of my life while there. You must look at this country to understand its power. The middle of the country is filled with the Hindu Kush mountains. So to get through it, you basically got to go north or south. North from Herat, three days to a town you never heard of, and then another day to Mazari Sharif, and then on to Kabul on a highway that was known to be reliable. The other way, Herat, down to Kandahar, and then up to Kabul, all the way avoiding the Hindu Kush mountains. Hindu killers, they're called, because every time the people from the subcontinent, conquerors, emperors, would try to come to Afghanistan. They didn't get very far. They got to Peshawar, they got across, and then they hit into those mountains and they were foiled. And that was the end of them. Likewise, our wanderer is in Herat. He's trying to get further east and ultimately decides the only way to go is south to Kandahar. This place, Kandahar, is very incredible. He really must be out of some fairy tale. People here are very interesting. Make that men, since the only time I see women is when they float by me in totally covered gray smocks called burkas with a netting over the face that does not even allow me to know their beauty. And they go all the way down to the ground. It's very strange. It's like seeing ghosts when you see the women. Many of the men here have small birds. It's a huge pastime just to hold them and play with them. Oftentimes, I get an imagery of pirates or a thousand and one Arabian nights 
in their turbans and flowing clothes. And then these men actually fight with these birds. It's quite exotic and very strange because the men actually seem quite peaceful. This place is really the first place since Morocco that's been so mood pervading to me. I'd like to read you from a letter home. Afghanistan has so much of such fine hashish that it is absolutely dangerous at so cheap of a price. I bought a piece, like a hamburger patty, for 45 cents. But there's so much more here than hashish. The people are all turbaned and wear fantastic loose flowing clothes. It is so different, it is shocking. It's an ancient land that barely feels the effect of time. The shops offer fantastic goods at really decent prices. I'd like to get some of these things from here as gifts. The streets are filled with flashing carriages that ring with bells. It's a fantastic image. The streets here at night are truly amazing and enchanting. The shops have wide open fronts, no doors along the dirt avenues glowing to a small gas lamp with people, of course only men, intermingling everywhere and a bit of night magic in the air. Then the tingle of bells as a horse-drawn carriage flows by while sitting on the small balcony of our hotel with Dick and Roger overlooking the street, four camels loaded with straw glide by to the desert. The camels are barely visible with the bales of straw so large. Much of the time, I have trouble comprehending where I am. Kandahar is a pretty dirt scramble type town. Got a lot of dirt roads. We went from Kandahar by bus, me, Dick and Roger, along one of these only roads that go from anywhere to anywhere, up to Kabul, and find ourselves in a much more modern city. Away from the downtown, we find a kind of a cool, hippie, tourist-type place called the Hindu Kush Hotel, named after the famous mountains. And as you can see, this is the kind of place where people are just hanging out. It had a beautiful backyard that had a wall around it for a lot of privacy. So it was, again, a real respite to get off those dirty streets and to be in a pleasant place. You had showers and you could sleep in a mass room, so it was cheap. And me and my English buddies, we found ourselves a room for three, and that was cheap. The hotel was really an old house. Kabul is a very strange place. I traded a jacket for two Afghani hats like this one. Colorful, woven skull caps that everyone seems to wear either by itself or with a turban wound around it. 11 May 1971, Tuesday, Kabul. The world's still spinning, so am I. Images of my coming destinations come smashing at me. Good blues scream out as French cats upstairs in the hotel wail on harp and soft guitar in the Kabul night air. Leaving Kabul is going to be tough because somehow this wild Afghanistan has become home to me away from home. I've enjoyed it. I've got my two English buddies with me. I'm comfortable but it's time to leave for sites unknown and places even unheard of. The Kabul Gorge was just magnificent. The gorge is the Kabul River going down, down, down towards the Pakistani border. There was a rock slide on the road and we had to wait for a bulldozer to clear the road overlooking the fantastic gorge thousands of feet below with the river raging.
it's important for me to recognize that we are at a momentous time in Afghanistan and its future is less certain than ever other than the severity of the Taliban, which seems to be in charge right now. And Americans, of course, you know, were fleeing in a sense, trying to get people out before the tyranny really starts. But there's a lot more going on in Afghanistan, and I believe we're going to have to stay tuned to see what happens as these folks actually have to govern and figure out how to work with people to make things work to some degree. Hopefully, things will get better. I've returned to Afghanistan after almost three months going across Pakistan into and across parts of the Himalayas in the Kashmir, then down into India and back up to Nepal, then back across India and Pakistan. It's 11 August, 1971, Wednesday, Kabul, Afghanistan. It's back to Afghanistan. When I shifted to Muslim culture in Pakistan, finally getting through the Indian border to Pakistan, and mostly just traveling across into Afghanistan, I missed the requirement that a man must cover himself. And I became quite the unintentional exhibitionist as Muslim men, far less women, do not show off legs, arms, and torso. It was this failure to observe local customs that led me to the incredible street scene upon my arrival in Kabul when I walked off the local bus without any shoes. My rubber sandals, the Zoris or flip-flops, having torn and so close to naked that the street people, all men of Kabul, were driven to derision of me and my sexy looks, my comments, whistles, even taking grabs at my midriff as I stumbled to find a place to stay and to get rid of my bulky green canvas backpack, stepping on nutshells and other identifiable items on the dirt street. Thirteen August, nineteen seventy-one, Friday, Kabul, Afghanistan, Friday the thirteenth. Whoa, hold on. What a trip this has been, and it keeps developing. Since my last writing in this journal, it's been something else. That writing was broken up by the formation of a group of travelers that rose around me as its center. All sorts of heavy vibes, then more realization of peace. I get on a bus, local bus, finally headed for mazar sharif I wind up meeting a meek Englishman on the bus. Everyone else is Afghani. So as is the reality, I sit with and get involved with the guy I can talk to and relate to. He is Nigel Buckle. Off we go into the incredible wild Afghanistan with its harsh brown mountains and thread of green along the road that followed a river for much of the distance of our trip. Then we go up through the midst of the Hindu Kush mountains via the Sailing Tunnel passageway, 1.6 miles long. It gets very cold up here and I am not dressed for it. Our bus follows a clean, beautiful looking waterway, but then the bus breaks down midway. We spent eight hours in this incredible little road village in a sort of traveler's cafe with a guy who worked there that reminded me of my brother Alvin, the way he screwed with everybody. Somehow we get to Mazar Sharif and we stagger into a hotel around 2 a.m. This is a very cool place. What a feeling walking through this beautiful, stark, ancient city with his large central mosque. Feelings of Samarkand and the Uzbekistan Soviet Republic just a few miles away to the north. Shades of caravans and the rest of Central Asia permeate this awesome place. 
the turquoise blue mosque in a great open area looks great, like a jewel from far away. But close up, it's crude and falling apart like most everything in this primitive country. I pick up a few of the crumbling blue tiles for a souvenir. This has been a very bizarre trip up here with very unusual people, more Mongol-like, and a whole different feel from the areas of Afghanistan that I have visited before. The hotel here in Mazar Sharif is a special place. It's got a large courtyard and it looks and feels grand with the rooms surrounding it. The courtyard that is like a fortress from the outside. Last night, there was a big celebration in the courtyard. They invited us foreigners staying here, including me to come eat and drink. It was quite a blast. Apparently, by the way, this is the hashish capital. And that is what they keep saying. And I'm getting to it and understanding that this is some good stuff. This, I think, is the best I've ever experienced. Wow. Here in Mazar Sharif, there is a very strange tourist trip going on with many sinister figures. They must be CIA. Interpol, etc., though it's difficult to figure out about face. All these agents and other Westerners are obviously here on business, but who knows what business? It's apparently covert activity. The nights are so soft, picture perfect after the roaring desert heat of the day. But what a feeling this place has, like living in Arabian nights. The men here act and look like they are part of an old Rudolph Valentino movie I remember as a youth, with their long turbans and glaring eyes. Good vibes off most everyone, though. Really, I am very high, mostly all the time now. I'm so excited to be on my way home. I can't wait in many ways, but for now, it's Afghanistan. Wow, what a fantastic place just to experience. After a few days in Mazar Sharif and hearing about Bach so much, I find my friend Nigel Buckle and I, and we decide to make our way to Bach together. Bach is some trip, a beautiful little town, great vibes with hashish that is simply the best and the cheapest. I have a wild adventure of walking out to the desert ruins. Bach is known as the mother of cities, as it is built and destroyed 33 times over history. It is on many world maps, although the town has a population now of perhaps only several thousand because of its influence historically. I go to Ball for Mazari on the back of a Russian military type vehicle for just a few cents with the Englishman I met on the way up to Mazari. Add the dimension of all kinds of trafficking of hashish, opium, and opiated hash to the scene, and it's quite a wild place. So we get off the open back end of the truck to check out the wrestling in the park inside the large traffic circle in the middle of the town. Of course, only men go there, as the women are basically hidden away, as in the rest of Afghanistan, other than some in Kabul. I have a wild adventure in Baal when we go out into the desert, past ruins, and actually buy some hashish from some farmers, and then returning before we get back on the military jeeps to take us back to Mazari Sharif. I am back in Kabul. I send letters out, but I forget to tell people where they should mail to me. I must be in Zurich, Switzerland in one month and one week to cash in the return airplane ticket I was forced to buy in Luxembourg 
or $118. That's a lot of money. That's my way home. I may go right home after that, but what's the rush? Kabul is a groove again, but soon I'll be very, very far from here. This journey on the way to Kandahar is marked by a camel on every hillock, as far as I can see for mile after mile of desert and mountains off in the distance. The English speaking fellow sitting next to me now tells me that these are wild camels and that there are a million, million of these wild camels here in Afghanistan. He also said when there's a drought like now, the Kuchi nomads are forced to eat the wild camels. Tuesday, 31st day of August, 1971, I'm in Kandahar. Staying grooved out in Kandahar, it's very good. Fell into some good local businessmen at the shirt shop. I met these guys the last time I was here. In the shop, people sit around smoking hashish, drinking tea, and doing some kind of business or so. It's a little hard to figure out. Just living this soft Kandahar life with the handcrafted ice cream, grapes, melon, french fries, kebab. It's hot. The nights are beautiful and soft. It's really a lot like being in the old west. It's just so timeless in many ways. My conclusion in regard to Afghanistan and my experiences there are that I have great sorrow I have observed the tragic events of the Cold War, then the various civil wars in Afghanistan, and now the American strikes, etc., and then the fall of the government and the Taliban is back in power. Ouch. While I understand the political realities and perhaps the necessities, the people of Afghanistan were, and I am sure are still simple, beautiful people who do not deserve the various hells they have suffered. I can only hope and pray for them and their land. Throughout it all, I remember with a smile and now a tear, the wonderful adventures I had in that incredible land. You may leave Afghanistan, but Afghanistan does not leave you. It took me a few weeks to go overland and by sea on the Black Sea and then across Europe to Amsterdam and to return to my home for a whole year's journey. But Afghanistan probably was the most incredible element and it will remain emblazoned in my mind.